Hey everybody, my name is Daryl Obera, and welcome to the Exterior Rendering and Vegetation Workflow webinar. So the assets that you're currently seeing are what we're going to be building today, and everything was done with the help of my friends from XFrog, who are actually co-presenting. They're going to show how XFrog works to generate all this cool vegetation, as well as how to use Pivot Painter, a script that Epic Games created that works inside of 3ds Max, to add all the natural looking movement that you see on the ground, as well as the apple tree. I'm going to cover a broad variety of topics. We'll start off with talking about exterior lighting and some ray tracing attributes that are kind of useful. Then we'll jump into the material editor and I'll give you a brief introduction into how it works with materials and material instances as we build up a material useful for vegetation. Finally, I'm going to end with the landscaping tools showing you how to use Brushify to sculpt out these beautiful natural hills and populate them with the foliage tool scattering all the cool assets that were developed. So thanks for taking the time to check this out. It's going to be a fun one, guys. Cheers. Alrighty, so here we are in Unreal, and I'm going to be going over some basic setup as well as giving you a quick overview of how to achieve pretty decent looking exterior lighting. So I obviously already have some assets loaded into the scene. We have this tractor and I've got a basic lighting model that's comprised of a directional light and a skylight as well as a height fog and an atmospheric fog. The atmospheric fog I, and the height fog I've got in here so that it can generate a nice gradient in the background and give me a basic sky system. And we're gonna be using this to also generate some slight volumetric effects throughout the presentation. Um, so it's really pretty awesome when you add those two components into your scene because it just makes light look really, really beautiful inside of Unreal. It's also worth mentioning that I have a post-process volume added to my environment already. And that post-process volume is set to infinite, so it covers the whole scene. And the reason I have this in my environment is because we're gonna be using it to do a few things. First of all, we're gonna be using it to um, fine tune ray tracing attributes. So I already have ray tracing turned on um, in DX12. This is running on an NVIDIA Quadro 2080 Max-Q. So it's a laptop running, uh, running the latest RTX graphics card. And you're gonna hear the, the GPUs light up the fans throughout this presentation, I'm sure. It's, <laughs> we're gonna have a good time and we're definitely gonna be pushing on it. So um, you're gonna hear some fans in the background, which is, which is always fun. And with this post-process volume, it gives us the ability to not only set up things like the color grading or how the film's gonna develop or maybe a lens flare or a bloom model. It has lots of control for kind of tuning the overall look and feel of your, of your visuals, but it also has the ability to adjust ray tracing parameters specific to that volume. And this is really important because it allows us to fine tune and balance the visual quality versus the speed because Unreal is a hybrid ray tracer. So we have the traditional raster renderer always kind of happening there. And then layered on top of that are ray tracing effects. And you can choose whether or not rays are going to, to contribute to the overall pixel um, based on thresholds, which is really pretty awesome. So if we kind of scroll down here, you'll see in the ray tracing area, I've got my max roughness set to a value of 0.7. So what that means is, any pixel that has a, a, a roughness value lower than 0.7 will actually kick off a ray and use that ray to calculate the reflection, which is pretty straightforward. So obviously anything that's got a roughness value higher than that will kick back and use a legacy method for generating the reflection. So it will use uh, screen space reflections or reflection probes or reflection actors. And I actually have some reflection actors kind of scattered around the tractor. So if we hit our G key here, let's just kind of show you where those guys are. It's a good idea to set up your reflection actors using best practices because as I mentioned previously, there's a really good chance certain pixels are gonna be using those to calculate the overall final color because again, it's this hybrid approach. So you wanna make sure that you, you get, you know, decent reflection actors placed around. And I've also taken this, um, the opportunity to increase the resolution of the reflection actors. Actually, I've changed several things in the, uh, in the system project settings. So let's just jump in there and I'll, I'll run you through what I did. And these are pretty, pretty standard for uh, enterprise workflow. So in project settings, if we just bring that up and we just start type uh, reflection. You can see that the reflection capture resolution, I've pushed up to 1024. We could go higher, but 1024 seemed about right for this for this file. Um, so that's gonna give us much higher quality reflections. I've also gone ahead and changed my buffer 
So if we just start to type buffer here, you can see I have on the gbuffer format, high precision normals turned on. And the reason I've done this is because the tractor asset is actually a very high polygon asset. So if I want to get the maximum quality of light and the maximum quality of reflections, you need to enable high precision normals. Now on the static mesh actors, there's also a couple toggles. And when you bring in data through Datasmith, they're actually already turned on. So I imported this data in through 3ds Max via Datasmith. So everything is already set up and ready to, uh, to achieve the maximum quality, which is pretty cool. So there was one other thing that I changed in the project settings, and that is the camera clipping plane. So the near camera clipping plane has a default value of 10. I pushed that down to one so that as we kind of zoom in on the tractor or get close to some vegetation, it doesn't get clipped with that default value of 10. So the final thing that um, I should mention is I also loaded the um, high dynamic range backdrop actor plugin. So if you just go to plugins and then search for um, HDR, and I think you have to highlight built in for it to show up, that HDRI backdrop actor has has been loaded because that's going to be the uh, the main the main lighting model um, once we go through some basics over here on on this one. So what we've got, as I mentioned previously, is, is you know a really pretty straightforward, basic basic lighting model. Direct illumination from the sky or from the from the from the sun, the directional light, and then we have the sky giving us kind of this this indirect model. And one thing that you're going to want to do, pretty much always, is set the color for your light. Like this is just a, a great thing to do. So you can see by default that use temperature is turned off. So we'll turn use temperature on, and I'll just drop that down to something like 5600. And you can see that as soon as I do that, or even if I go down to 4000, you know, it really, whoa, 400, that's super red. Let's, let's not do that. Let's go to 4000. You know, it really warms the scene up. Now there's another kind of interesting way of adjusting the overall color of the light. So I'm gonna turn off use temperature. And if we just search for sun in the light here, we're gonna turn on atmospheric fog and sunlight. And this is, this is actually gonna change the background and this is gonna be something that we're gonna, we're gonna leave on throughout the demo because I really like sort of these little volumetric effects and things that we're gonna, we're gonna achieve by having that height fog in here as well as the atmospheric fog. So by turning on atmospheric um, fog and sunlight, now if we go over to the atmospheric fog with sun still in my search parameter, you can see that we can affect atmosphere Atmosphere affects sun illumination. So as soon as I turn that on, now you can see that the color model has changed to basically capture the overall orientation of the sun. So if I put the sun higher in the sky, obviously it's going to, to get cooler. If I put the sun really low, it's going, to, it's going to get warmer. So by turning on those couple little switches, we now have a sun model that's, that's being you know, kind of calculated for us based on the orientation of, of the sun, which is, which is pretty awesome. So with that done, the next thing that we want to talk about really quickly is getting an HDRI backdrop actor into our environment. And, and how do we do that? Well, it's actually, it's really, really straightforward. It's just a drag and drop process. So we'll just drag and drop that guy in. With that done, we'll clear out our search and I'll just hit the reset to default to zero that guy out. So this is looking pretty good. Now, the thing that's interesting about the HDR backdrop actor is this is made up of a few, a few components. So you've got geometry. It's actually using a projection system that we're going to, we're going to modify in just a bit here, but you could project this onto other types of geometry. We ship with a, a dome, um, a cube, a rounded cube. There's lots of different, you know, kind of workflows that you can use because it is based on projections, it's, it's quite flexible. And then it also has a skylight built into it. So you can see that um, you know these lights are set to movable as well as my directional light is set to movable because everything again that we're doing is going to be dynamically lit. So with that kind of settled, let's go ahead and delete that other skylight. We don't, we don't need two skylights in our scene. We'll just, we'll just kind of get rid of that guy. And what I wanna do is I want to go ahead and first thing I'm going to do is make sure that my game settings is turned off. Now, this is something that I do almost always when I start to light a scene. Game settings awesome and it's it's really powerful. It's the auto exposure and sometimes it it can get in the way when you're trying to get a baseline for your lighting. So my my advice is to turn that off when you're setting up your initial lighting model and then after you have everything looking really good with it with it off and you feel like you might need it because you want to, you know, you want to have that auto exposure happening, you know, feel free to turn it back on. But for the initial lighting process, my, my advice is definitely, uh, definitely turn that off. So with that said, let's go ahead and let's just start to increase the overall 
Um, intensity of this HDRI backdrop a little bit. So we'll put that up to like a value of two. And I'm just gonna go ahead and just maybe drop this uh, maybe one, uh, two is pretty good. 1.5 looks actually pretty good. So when I'm working with the HDRI backdrop actor, I still pretty much always use a directional light. Like I, I just feel like I get a much, it, you know, a much cleaner result. It's, it's very similar to the way I would light things with a traditional software renderer where I'm, I'm using that, you know, the light environment for the, for the indirect illumination. And then I've got obviously the, the key light or the directional light to, to represent the sun. So that's pretty awesome. So we talked about it being a projection map. Um, and you can see as I move around here that it's got this kind of ground plane. It's got the shadow catcher, which is which is awesome. Really, really, really um, nice to have that stuff built in. But you can see that there's like a bench here that's kind of smearing across the ground and the tree trunks are smearing across the ground. So it's not really positioned correctly. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab that projection node and I'm just going to translate that up. And as I translate that up, you can see that it goes ahead now and the bench is sort of doing what you would expect. It's kind of hanging out there in the back. And if I wanted to get the grass to be in a different spot, it's a matter of just changing how that, um, that light probe is being projected onto that, onto that geometry, which is really pretty awesome. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that our sun that's in that light probe, and if we kind of spin around here, you'll see, you know, up there, there's there's like a sun up there, right? We want to make sure that that sun and this light, this directional light, are in the same the same location, same orientation. So how do you do that? Well, it's actually really really pretty simple. I'm just going to go over here, and I've got my plugin content turned on as well as my engine content filters turned on. So if we come over to our search folder and just start to type color and you can see in color calibrator we have this nice little color calibrator and it's got a chrome ball on it which is great so what we're going to do is we're going to use that chrome ball to help make sure that our two sunspots line up with each other so let's just kind of frame in on that guy we'll kind of spin around here so i'm going to go ahead and just drop my exposure make it nice and dark and you can see actually they're, they're pretty close to each other. Um, that's, that's kind of cool. So we'll just grab this guy and I can just use orientation to uh, start to align those. So as I start to move this, you can see we'll just kind of drop it down and then I'll just sort of, you know, push it, push it over there. And you know, that's looking pretty good. So now that that's done, we can go back and we now have suns in the same spot, which just looks really, really cool. So we can kind of fly around this tractor now and start to think about what's ray tracing contributing. So is it, it's actually all turned on right now. And, and it looks, it looks really, it looks really pretty cool. So I'm just going to start turning some of the stuff off. So we talked about the fact that the HDRI backdrop actor had a skylight in there and that skylight, actually, if we highlight that guy and just type ray to filter out ray tracing, you can see that it's, it's, by default set to ray trace um, the shadows and the ray trace that skylight. So if we turn this off, you can see right away a pretty big change. Um, we lose that, that grounding underneath that fender and all the contact patches under, underneath where the tires kind of come in just don't look nearly as good without ray tracing the HDRI backdrop actors skylight. So that's, uh, that's obviously something that you're going to want to keep on and it's, it's awesome that it is on. The other thing that... Um, is really kind of adding a lot to the visual look of this is ray trace reflection. So I'm just gonna use some console variables to quickly turn these on and off. This is easily done by using the tilde key. So if I just hit the tilde key and use my up and down arrow keys, it's going to turn on and off the, you know, I have a list of the last things I've done. So if we turn reflections off by putting this to zero, look inside the wheel, like the rim, you're gonna see a big change as soon as I do that. You know, like it, it definitely got a lot brighter as soon as I, you did that, cause it's not really tracing those reflections anymore. So we'll turn that guy, you know, we'll put the reflections back on and you can see that, that pretty d drastic change. And obviously if we come over here to the back of the tractor and, and throw that switch again here, you're gonna see a lot, a lot of change and how all of these surfaces reflect each other. So, you know, instead of using um, true ray trace reflections and it's using reflection probes, it's just never going to have that, you know, ultra, ultra high realism that you can get with, with true ray tracing. And the final thing that we want to kind of turn on and off just to give you a sense of, of what ray tracing is bringing to the table here is the reflections on the glass. So if we hit the tilde key one more time and just go to ray trace translucency and throw that to zero, 
Again, a pretty, pretty significant impact on the canopy here, as well as these back brake lights and things like that. So we'll turn that stuff back on just because obviously it, it, looks, it looks really, really cool. So the next thing that we want to do is I just want to modify a couple of attributes in the post-process volume to start to make this look even better. So as I sort of, uh, here, we'll come back to the back. Actually, we'll go, we'll go up here. Let's go to the front. We'll, we're we're going to kind of swipe across here. So as I move across here, you can see that that, that bloom looks pretty good. We're getting this nice kind of little rolling highlight across this very uh, kind of dirty painted surface. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the post-process volume and I'm going to actually change and we can stop searching ray tracing. I'm going to actually go ahead and change the lens effects really quickly on bloom. So instead of having the standard method, I'm going to kick this over to the convolution. And as soon as we do that, you can see we get that really nice little hot pop happening and it gets that little cool star pattern as we kind of swipe across there. And I'm just going to go back to my directional light. And on this directional light, I'm also going to give it just a little tiny bit of source angle just to kind of soften it up like it's kind of coming through the cloud. So you can see it just kind of smeared that out a little bit, a little bit longer there. As I kind of move that around there, it just looks really, really nice. And if we kind of scroll back here to the back side of the of the uh, of the, the tractor and start to move around here, you know, you get that really nice sense of that that bloom kind of happening. So the next thing that I want to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and I'm going to turn on while we have this directional light up. A little bit of a, a little bit of God rays happening. So let's go back into the directional light, and if we kind of come down here toward the bottom of this guy, you're going to see light shafts. So we'll turn that on, and when you turn it on, because we've got this environment probe in here, we're going to need to set that occlusion depth down to something smaller than the environment probe there are the HDR backdrop actor. So I'll just put that down to something like 2,000. And then if we turn on the shafts, the light bloom shafts here, as I start to move around, you get the sense of that light sort of burning around and doing its thing. And you can really get that, uh, you see that little, that little flare kind of kicking off. That's, that's because we changed that flare model or that bloom model. And we're getting these little volumetric streaks sort of happening through here. And this, this might be a little bit strong. I'm going to go ahead and just turn that to something like a value of, of 0.1. I just want it to be really quite subtle, but you can still see it kind of through this area. And hopefully that's going to pick up on the, uh, on the screen recording. It's, it's a subtle effect, but I, I, I kind of like it, um, when it, when it's just this nice little, nice little subtle effect kind of happening there. And that's, uh, that's basically it for, for getting that stuff set up. So now that we've got a decent looking lighting model in our environment and we've gone ahead and we've got the sun aligned with each other, we've done some post-process work. The next thing that we want to do is start to generate some vegetation. So I'm just going to jump over to a bookmark and we'll load in a piece of geometry to start generating a material and I'll walk you through how that's done. All right, so we're going to spend the next 15 minutes walking you through the process of creating a vegetation material. So a little vegetation look development. Now, 15 minutes isn't a lot of time, so we're not going to be making the most sophisticated vegetation material, but I am going to introduce you to the concepts of working with the material editor inside of Unreal, making master materials, and from those master materials, generating material instances. And it, it'll all make sense sort of as I, as I go along and explain it. So the first thing that we want to do is get some assets inside of our scene to begin working with. So we'll jump into my ground cover and I'm going to grab, uh, grab this fern and we'll just drag and drop that into our scene and we'll just frame up that fern. And as I start to look at this fern, obviously this isn't looking that great. I mean, the colors, the color is crazy. Um, if we look at the backside of this guy, there's no leaves on it. I mean, we've got some cool God rays from that, that awesome lighting model that we set up, but this is not how you want a fern to, uh, to look. So we need to make some changes to this and we're going to be doing that in the material editor. So let's get that opened up by selecting the plant, going over to the details tab and double clicking on the demo, uh, the master demo material. So this is the material editor. Unreal is based on a PBR workflow. So we have a PBR material sitting over here on the right hand side and mapped into it. We've got that crazy color map some roughness values. Uh, I've got a mask file that's kind of giving all the detail where the edge leaves are. And then we have a normal map. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to modify a couple things to make it have a better shading model and to, um, to have leaves everywhere. So go over to the details panel on the left-hand side of the material editor, and I'm going to switch the 
shading model to two-sided foliage. So this is an awesome model specifically made for doing uh, vegetation and foliage effects. So that's perfect. And we're also going to toggle on two-sided. So we've made some changes in the material editor. Um, the shading model has been updated and it's now set to two-sided. Let's jump back into the viewport and see what we have. So notice as I move around here that actually nothing has changed in the, in the level. And the reason nothing has changed in the level is because whenever you're working in the material editor, you need to update or hit the apply button to make these changes get pushed into the level or into the material instances that you're working with. So this is a kind of a key concept. This is not a truly live environment. You're basically making material code here and any changes you make, you have to actually recompile and hit, hit the update button. So if I go ahead and hit apply, it's going to go through and it says, all right, cool. We're going to, uh, you know, make the changes and apply those to the world. If we go back over here, you can see it just, it just recompiled that, that material. And now if we escape and kind of spin around, you know, there's, 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 uh, there's leaves everywhere, which is exactly what we want, but the colors still, still really, really bad. So let's go ahead and start making some more, some more changes in the material editor. So if you've ever used any node-based workflows, you're going to feel right at home inside the material editor. If you've, if you've done compositing work or you've made materials in other node-based systems, DCC apps or something like that, it's a very similar workflow. So on the right-hand side, I have a palette. That palette has all the nodes that I can use to, to generate materials. And I mean, you can just write the most amazing, crazy things. There's, there's just so much functionality inside of here. We're going to be doing pretty basic stuff, but you'll still get a sense of the, uh, the overall workflow and logic behind it as we, as we move along. So I can also create nodes by just right-clicking on the grid and searching. So I'm going to search for something called desaturation because the color is, it's just bad. So I've got a desaturation node and I want to introduce that into on the way to the base color. So it's just literally a process of dragging and dropping to wire these guys together. So I'm just using my left mouse button to, to rewire and introduce this desaturation node on the way to, uh, to base color. So now that I've done that, the next thing that I want to do is I want to make the fraction be a parameter that I can edit in real time. So how do you do that? It's actually really straightforward. If you go to the parameter, and this is for any parameter inside of the editor, and you right click on top of it, you can say promote. So once we promote that to a parameter, it's automatically highlighted. So I'm just gonna call it DSAT and hit the return key and just kind of arrange these guys. So I've now got a desaturation attribute parameter that's been exposed. So if we go ahead and hit the apply button and we close this back down, what I wanna do is from this master material, this M demo master material, I wanna create a material instance. The reason is material instances have the ability to modify any of the parameters that have been promoted in real time. So the idea is you have one master material that's got all the crazy logic and you promote and you build your own custom material instances. And you'll probably have, you know, five, six, 10 material instances from one master material. So to do that, it's just literally right click, create material instance. So we'll just give this a name. We'll call it MI, just uh, it's good practice, demo material instance. So now what I wanna do is I want to have this material be assigned to the fern. It's just a drag and drop process. So if we highlight this guy, you can see now, um, the material slot is being mapped with MI demo material instance. So if we double click on this and we just shrink this guy down, this window looks a little bit different than the material editor. This is the material instance editor. And what it has is it's got that one parameter that we just promoted. So if I turn that guy on and just start to drag on top of it, you can see I can now desaturate in real time. There's no reason for me to hit the apply button and wait for it to compile because I'm working with a material instance. So that's, that's the basic workflow, right? So let's jump back into our material editor and let's, let's add in some more nodes and build in some more sophistication to this, uh, to this model. So the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna, we wanna do some fun stuff with color here. So I wanna do some, some Fresnel effects or some facing ratio effects on, on that color map. So I'm going to right click and I'm gonna start typing fuzzy and we're gonna grab this fuzzy shading grass node. So this node has lots of different attributes that you can promote. So all I have to do again is just right click on top of it and say promote to parameter. And what's kind of nice about this is it automatically names it for me. So we're gonna do uh, edge, edge color. 
When I promote this to a parameter, notice that it gave me a vector three or a color swatch. So I'm gonna set its default value. So this is going to be the default value that every instance will start with for that guy. Pretty straightforward. And I could do the same thing for edge desat too. I could give it maybe a default value of, you know, something like 0.5. It's gonna automatically desaturate the edges um, by 0.5. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna also provide this fuzzy shading grass node with the normal map. So it can use that normal information to drive the effect. So we'll just pipe that into there. Maybe we'll just scoot everything over to kind of make it nice and tidy. And we're gonna go ahead and we're going to continue to promote a few more of these. So we'll promote the core darkness and we'll just drop that there and we'll give this a value of something like, I don't know, 0.5 also. And we're going to promote power. This is the last one that we're gonna promote. And we'll just make the power something a value of 1.5. So with that done, I'm going to just kind of organize these guys by holding down my shift D key to kind of snap those guys all and line them up. And we'll just pipe this into base color. So we've now built a little machine that's going to go through and basically take our color value. We're gonna desaturate it first. And then we're gonna shove that into the diffuse of this guy. I missed a step there, sorry about that. Let's just pull these guys up just so it's a little easier to see what's going on on that guy. So the diffuse goes in and so we have an overall desaturation and then we have a desaturation that's going to only happen on the edge effects that's going to be driven by the power and the core darkness. Um, so it's, it's really, it's pretty awesome. So the next thing that we want to do before we jump back into that material instance is I also want to build a, a little machine that's going to allow me to adjust the normals. And we have lots of different nodes to work with normals, but in this example, I'm gonna build up a system that will allow me to decrease and overdrive the effect of the normal map. So to change the intensity of a normal map, what you're trying to do is you're trying to isolate red and green and adjust those values and keep the blue channel the same. So how do you do that? It's super simple with a few nodes inside of the material editor in Unreal. So what I'm gonna do is just right click and just start searching for mask and I'm going to grab component mask. And you can see that component mask by default is isolating red and green. So we'll just take RGB into component mask. So we've now isolated those guys out. So the next thing we wanna do is we want to create something that's going to allow me to increase the, in, the, the intensity of red and green or decrease it. And that's easily done with, um, with a multiply node. Now you'll notice in the palette, there's a bunch of different um, nodes that have numbers and letters next to them. Anywhere you see that, that means there's a hotkey that can generate that node. So to generate a multiply node, all I have to do is hold down the M key on my keyboard and with my left mouse button, click. And I've just made a multiply node without having to search or do anything. So it's, there's lots of the most common nodes are, are kind of set up that way. So it makes working with the material editor extremely fast. So we're just gonna wire that guy together. Then obviously we need to adjust the multiplier B um, in the material instance, so I wanna promote that to a parameter, pretty straightforward. And we'll just call this instead of B, I don't know, we'll call it normal. This is gonna be my normal strength. And now that we've done that, the next thing we need to do is we need to get that blue channel back into, uh, back into the mix here. So we're gonna use an append node to do that. So if I right click and just start to type append, I gotta start with an A, and we'll get an append vector. So we're gonna take the red and green that we now can uh, increase and decrease with our multiply, and we're gonna append the B into it. So it's just a matter of wiring this stuff up. And just like that, we've now got a system that's going to allow me to increase and decrease the normal map. So I'm gonna go back to this normal, and I'm gonna set its default value to one so that whenever I, you know, it basically isn't changing the normal map, but I have the flexibility to change it if I want to. So now that we've done all of that logic, let's go ahead and click the apply button. So it's gonna go through, it's going to update the original material to use in the world. And if we jump over to the material instance and we kind of zoom this guy down here and we just sort of, let's just kind of fly in on this stuff and you know, kind of, kind of sit right around there. So now we've got all this stuff that we can use to adjust the overall effect of, uh, of the shading on this guy. So it looks, it looks a lot different, right? So we've got our, we've got our overall saturation If I can, I can turn that off, but we also have this edge desaturation. So if I zero that out, you can see the edges are gonna get greener. And if I put that up to like a value of one, they're gonna get very desaturated. And the, in the kind of effect of that desaturation and how that desaturation happens is made from a combination of the power 
and the core darkness. So if I make that core darkness really high, like a value of two, you can see that it's gotten, you know, it's really, really overdriven. So maybe we drop that power down a little bit. Um, that doesn't look so great. So I'm gonna put this core darkness down to something like 0.9. And you can see as I adjust the power, this is going to change the interpolation of the ramp that's doing that kind of Fresnel effect. So it gives you a lot of creative freedom, a lot of control over top of this. And of course, we still have the edge color in here. So if I didn't want to mix in like a green color into the edge, I could just have it go, you know, go out, go out to white and sort of, you know, make it look really kind of soft, soft and fuzzy, you know, something like that starts to look pretty good. Maybe put the power up to something like a value of two and drop that core darkness back down to something like a value of 0.7 maybe give it a little bit more desaturation, something like 0.5 to overall desaturate it. But you know, now we've gotten something that looks drastically different than what we had before. And you really get a sense of, you know, what that, that fuzzy, that fuzzy grass does. It's actually a really pretty, pretty fun, pretty fun node. And of course, we've also got our normal map on here. So if I wanted to decrease the intensity of the normal map, I could do something like 0.5. Or if I wanted to overdrive it, I could do something like a value of two. So, you know, having that functionality and that flexibility built into the material instance is really what it's, it's all about. So the next thing I want to do is add in two more bits of functionality to our master material. I want to add in some subsurface color information or some control for that. And I also want to make a very basic wind model, actually the most basic wind model, because in the next demo, in the next portion of the demo, we're going to be letting XFrog take over and they're going to be generating some sophisticated vegetation and a very, very high end wind model done in Max with Pivot Painter. So the, the wind that we're gonna make is just, it's just more of a concept. So let's jump back into our master material in our material editor and let's add in a little bit more logic here. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I want to, I wanna control this subsurface color and I want to be able to desaturate that also. So I'm gonna just highlight both of these guys with my shift key and then hit control W to duplicate them and drag this down and we're going to take the output of that into this. We're going to change this from DSAT to, um, I don't know, we'll just call it SSS or SSC, subsurface color, DSAT. And I also want to um, you know, do a multiply on that guy. So I'll highlight both of those and just hit control W to get my multiply and we'll just sort of wire that guy up and wire that guy up and for this, we're going to change this from normal to just SSC. So that's gonna be my subsurface color intensity. So I have the ability to desaturate it as well as adjust the overall um, value of it. So pretty straightforward there, that's awesome. So the final thing that we wanna do is add in the ability to modify um, this and have a little bit of wind happening. So we're gonna do a world position offset and we're gonna use grass wind to do it. So I'm just gonna slide this out so that we have a little more room to work here. I'm gonna create a new node, and it's gonna be called Grass Wind. So we'll grab this simple Grass Wind, pretty straightforward, and that's going to drive World Position Offset. So we're making a, a, vertex, a vertex shader, basically. So wind intensity, we want to promote to a parameter. Great, uh, wind height we'll promote to a parameter. Also, uh, also great, um, wind speed we'll promote to a parameter. And then the additional world position will promote to a parameter. And this is just going to be a vector. So, um, you know, we'll just make it go. It's uh, red, green, and blue for X, Y, and Z. So we'll just, just push it up in red just so you can see what that does. So I'm going to give these guys like a default value of something low, like 0.2. Um, and this is, this is a really, really simple example. Oops, let's... Uh, not change the slider there. We'll make that one point two. We'll make this one point two, of using using grass wind. But you could combine this with other nodes. You could, you know, people have built some relatively uh, sophisticated wind systems using, you know, a few of these different wind models and, and combining them with, you know, color per vertex or panner nodes. There's all kinds of really interesting things you can do. But, you know, we gotta we gotta keep moving forward here. We've got a lot to talk about in a very short amount of time. So this is this is more about more about the, you know, inspiring you guys and giving you all kind of a concept of, of how things sort of work in Unreal. It's really, really what we're trying to do here. So now that we've done all that, we're going to hit the apply button and we're going to jump out. And what we're going to see is actually going to be, uh, it's going to be a little anomaly. And this is exactly uh, 
what I want to happen because I want to explain to you a few things that aren't currently supported in ray tracing and, and kind of uh, kind of ways to work around that. So with that done, we got all that stuff kind of wired up. Pretty straightforward. We'll hit save. We'll jump back out. So you can see I've got a little bit of wind happening on this guy. And I've got, I've got this weird effect happening where there's like shadows basically passing through. And the reason that's happening is world position offset is not fully supported in Unreal 4.23. So world position offset is supported in two scenarios. It's supported in the landscape tool. So if you did like, you know, you did a material that did this like and distorted the, the geometry and landscape material, it would work. It's also supported on, on deformation surfaces. So if you exported this file out as an FBX file, and brought it back in and turned on skeleton, it would actually work correctly. So just keep that in mind. Um, obviously, the ray tracing stuff is changing fast and furiously. Every release, we support more things. The quality gets better. The speed gets better. I just mentioned two things that world position offset, you know, were improved in 423, but this, this didn't get there. Um, so to fix that, the workaround is actually pretty easy. I'm just not going to ray trace the shadows on my directional light. So if we go to our directional light and we search for ray, and we turn off ray trace shadows, you can see, all right, it, it looks a lot better automatically, but those shadows are actually, you know, they're, they're kind of soft. And when I have lots of vegetation in here, you can see they're buzzing and they're not doing a good job. So I'm going to just go down to my cascades and then just increase the number to, to give it a little bit more information to work with. So instead of having three, we'll just put that to something like five. And you can see just by doing that, we've now got, you know, this really nice uh, shadows on there. We've got, we've got the fern looking pretty good. And as I, you know, kind of move around this guy, that subsurface is, it's a, it's a little crazy. It's actually really crazy. Here, let's just drag and drop this one on there. That's, that's one that I dialed in a little bit better. But same idea. We could just go in there and start changing those parameters in the material instance. But that was basically how I went through and, and set this fern up. You get this really nice little, you know, little light bleed effect happening there. If you, if you see the sun as it kind of wiggles around here, let's just try to get that edge right on the edge there. And it'll kind of move in and out of the sun ever so slightly. I um, mean, the God rays look, look really, really pretty cool. So that's the basics of building a material inside of Unreal using the material editor and material instances to give you the functionality to adjust those guys in real time. So up next are my friends from XFrog. We have Stuart and Kelsey. They're going to be walking you through the process of generating geometry as well as building really high quality win in 3ds Max using the Pivot Painter plugin or the pivot painter script I should say that epic has made so it's a, it's an awesome workflow let's check it out everybody thank you Daryl my name is Stuart McSherry I work for XFrog and today we're going to be talking about parametric modeling of plants I would like to begin by showing you some of the results of XFrog parametric modeling and then jump into two short modeling sessions where I'll explain how it works so to get started I would like to visit our website xfrog.com at the bottom left corner, you will see a link. It will take you to a page of free content. So as a gift for watching this webinar, we'd like to offer you a lot of different free content, flowers, trees. And also I wanted to show you now some libraries. So we have 31 libraries of plants. I'm gonna show you Europe 3, and I'm gonna pick a language. I'm gonna pick Italian and show you the PDF. It's an interactive PDF um, of that library. This library has 160 plants. And you can look at any of them, zoom into anything you want, have a kind of close look at our textures and renders of our plants. Now we're gonna skip forward to some customer content. So these are renders created with our plants by different people. This is Masi-san. He's created a render and I quite like the feeling and rendering of this uh, image. And we're gonna show you a few works by Luke Bianco He's another power user of XFrog. And there's, here's a Monterey Cypress created quite some time ago, but still kind of holds up. And here's um, some more, the Firebird plant that he created, uh, renders, beautiful renders of. Um, these are not unreal. I just want to make it clear, these are not real-time renders. These are, um, took some time to set up. Um, and we're working really hard on getting this kind of level of quality in Unreal. And it's truly amazing that today we're on the cusp of reaching these kinds of results in Unreal in real time. So now I'd like to talk about a, a book. Uh, it's called The Digital Design of Nature. It was written by Oliver Doyson and Bernd Lynchman, the co-founders of XFrog. 
and it's a survey of every approach known for uh, basically simulating plants with computer graphics, computer science. And it's a great survey, actually 300 pages um, throughout history of different approaches, rule-based, procedural-based, including a chapter on XFROG. And here we have a page from the book. It's covering phylotaxis, which is a very important component of XFROG. It's using golden angle, golden mean, golden section, Fibonacci sequence, whatever you want to call it. And I can't really define this, <laughs> this in 10 minutes, so I'm just going to skip over that. And here's branching. So also very, very important to have different types of branching techniques built into your so parametric software. And these are all in XFROG. So now I'd like to give you a demo of XFROG itself. I'm going to open an Agave. This is the XFROG window standalone. This model comes with the standalone free of charge. There's a set of, of demo models that come with the software when you download the trial or buy the software. Um, Agave, we all know Agave. I don't like these leaves in the middle, so I'm going to go and edit those. And while, while, do, while doing that, I'm going to kind of give you an idea of how easy XROG is to use. So, and you can see now the in the left side, there's a hierarchy window of components that are pulled from the bottom window here, these component window, and and and, and connected together to create this model. So I have a fee ball, which is a multiplier connected to a, and a branch is connected to the fee ball, which basically emanate, uh, emits the branch from the fee ball. So I can control the fee ball, the number of fee balls of, sorry, the number of leaves emitting from the fee ball is controlled here. So I'm adding a little bit more complexity to the plant and I'm going to remove this center part that I don't really like. So I'm, first I'm going to try to fix it um, to show you how the editing tools work. So I can basically have a, you know, I can, I can edit leaf by leaf structurally. This is actually a tree but it looks like a leaf and or it's a branching component so and now I have um, I've added many more uh, branches to the fee ball and I'm gonna go in and delete the, those ugly ones in the middle and add a few more branches so now I have a pretty good fee ball and I'm pretty happy with this version of the model now so that's pretty very super fast demo of XFROG I'm gonna kind of smooth these out in the center because I put too many and now I'm going to give it a little more crack, uh, phototropism and gravitropism and then move on to the next model. So I've loaded a model called Yarrow. It's an herb. And I thought it would be nice to show you something other than a tree. It's a small plant, but um, it has quite a lot of detail. And it has all the principles we've been talking about. It has branching and it has phylotaxis. And it's very straight, and it's also easy to demo because it's, uh, you know, it's only five components. Each component has some parameters on that I've set for the each of the components. So if I just wanted to explain this model to you, I can hide the other parts. So this is the brand, this this component here is the trunk with the leaves. This leaf. And I have various settings for each one of these uh, components. So the trunk, I can change the length. I can change the scale. It's kind of uh, shrinks the, kind of like clips the trunk on the edges. Um, I can make the trunk more crooked. I can create more leaves and it's very simple software to use and I can also arrange the leaves in a number of different ways so lateral perpendicular alternate perpendicular alternate lateral paraperpendicular paralateral these are all um, types of branching found in nature that you absolutely need if you're going to try and simulate trees and plants so I'm going to put this kind of back where it was and I'm going to show you now the um, the rest of the plant, so how that was built. So we have here uh, the canopy and the flowers of the plant, and those are basically um, this branch is fed into a fee ball, and the fee ball has um, it's basically the phylotaxis control, so it, it's a sphere. So you can control it as if you're controlling a sphere. 
so I can add more. I can make them branch more like a spherical shape. I can change their angle, the way they're oriented around the sphere. And then I can translate them. So you can get all kinds of weird stuff very quickly, very simply, but very, very, very easily. Very easy to adjust uh, any of our models. And anything you get, if you download our free samples or if you uh, buy any of our plants, they all come with the XFR. So you can go in and, and change them however you want. They're super easy to edit. You can also change the, the complexity. So right now it's 9,000 polygons. I pulled the slider down, it's, it's now 4,000. So it's still a lot, but yeah, it's a pretty detailed plant. And that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Kelsey Rice, here to show you how we at XFraud use Pivot Painter 2 in our pipeline. Pivot Painter 2 is a powerful free plugin from Epic that allows us to add realistic wind to XFraud plants. Let's get started. Here, I've opened one of our ground cover species, the Yarrow, as well as run the Pivot Painter 2 Max script, available for free from Epic. Notice how all the leaves in this model are separate objects. When using Pivot Painter, any part of the plant that moves uniquely in the wind needs to be a separate object. For a quick method of separating out your model, check out the Detach Elements options in Pivot Painter's prep tools. In this example, I want the leaves to flutter in the breeze while attached to the stem, which will sway back and forth. To do this, we need to set up a hierarchy. Since the leaves are attached to the stem, we need to make them children of the stem in the hierarchy, like so. Just selecting all the leaves, making them children. Every sub-object that moves in the wind also needs its own pivot point. Pivot Painter 2 can generate pivot points for you under the Generate New Pivot Point section if necessary. In this example, I'm creating a selection set for all the leaves. Now I'm taking that selection set and choosing a leaf pivot object, in this case the mesh for the stem, and creating new pivot points. As you can see here, each of these new pivot points are located right at the base of the leaf, and the x-axis follows the length of the leaf. So these all look good, auto-generated. We also want to make sure the stem itself has a good pivot point. So you can see here that it isn't rotated correctly, so I'm just going to quickly fix it so that the x-axis points up. Now all the pivot points look good. Once the pivots have been assigned, you need to recreate the model's bounding boxes. Pivot Painter 2 captures the length of a branch or leaf by finding out how long its bounding box is along the x vector. Recreating bounding boxes ensures the script has the correct information. You simply need to click Process Selected Objects. Now it's time to export. First, we save out pivot position and x vector data by clicking Process the Selected Hierarchy and choosing a save location. Next, we export the mesh as an FBX. I'm now in Unreal Engine, and I'm importing the mesh. Make sure Skeletal Mesh is unchecked, and Combine Meshes is checked. So I've imported the two maps that give the X vector and pivot position data. Make sure to follow the import settings as detailed on the Pivot Painter 2 guide online. Here, I set up a really simple material utilizing the Pivot Painter 2 Foliage Shader node, which you can see right here. Um, for the sake of this demo, I've just set it up simply with some colors hooked up. Um, so any of the materials on the ground cover will be using an instance of this material with these nodes. So here I have a material open for the stem. When we set up the object in Max, we had the top level of the hierarchy was the stem, which was the parent, and then you had the leaves under it which were the children. In total, that's two levels, which correspond to the wind settings here in the parameters. So um, because I only have two levels, we only need to turn on two wind settings. So the first thing you do is swap out the textures that we imported for the ones here. So those two are this one, the X vector, and the other one is the position index texture. As you can see here, now that I've put these in, it's starting to wiggle, but it doesn't look that great. For this particular mesh, I think it looks a bit better with some of these values turned down. One of the numbers I tend to play with first is the max rotation. In this case, I'm going to turn it up quite a bit. 
This will affect how much the plant is moving in the wind. Um, another one I tend to play with is the dampening radius multiplier. This will affect where it's actually wiggling from. So we've got the stem moving. Let's get those leaves going. Here you can see how much stronger the wind looks if I just play with a couple values in here. I've turned up the max rotation and both the leaves and the branch. Here I've quickly put together a cluster of gyro using just two models that looks natural with minimal effort. I was able to quickly use this tool on a plethora of XFROG ground cover models. As you can see, they'll go well very nicely together and can be implemented quickly and conveniently. Well, thank you so much, Kelsey and Stuart, for that run through of the application. Super, super cool. So this is just another example of XFROG and Pivot Painter in action. Obviously, it's just larger asset. It's an apple tree and all modeled in XFROG and then obviously animated using the Pivot Painter plugin, which does just such a beautiful job of the subtle movement of the leaves that then kind of tugs on the branches. And then we got a little bit of depth of field on, on the camera here. And then as I kind of move through this, I've actually got some other trees or some other vegetation down here on the ground that we want to use to start to scatter across this environment. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to generate a terrain and we're going to be using a content pack that I downloaded from the marketplace called Brushify to assist us in the generation of that landscape. And Brushify is just a really cool tool. The guy who wrote it is actually the recipient of an Epic Mega Grant. And it just gives us the ability to generate very, very fast landscapes and terrain. So let's check it out. All right, so let's jump over to the landscape tool and check it out. So here we are. And the first thing that I'm going to do is just make that HDR backdrop actor be a little bit lower so that it's not in the same Z space. And I've got my size set relatively small, seven by seven quads, resolution set out to 32 by 32. And you can see that the material's already assigned. And this is the brush off eye material instance landscape. And this is really where the magic happens. So if we hit create, what's going to happen is it's going to go through and it's going to add on this material. And what we want to do is define which type of landscape we want to start with by selecting one of these layers. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab the grass layer and we'll just click on that and assign it. In just a few seconds, it's going to go through an update and we'll no longer have you know, this kind of blank black ground plane, we're going to have a ground plane that's got this very sophisticated procedural um, landscape material that does really, really fun things. And there's there's a variety of materials in here, you know, snow, snow capped mountains and deserts and forests, and they all have a procedural nature to them so that you can have vegetation grow on areas um, that are that would receive that type of vegetation like desert plants only grow on the desert and when you paint snow the plants kind of disappear so it has all this really nice beautiful procedural kind of workflows built into it now for this demo I'm not going to be doing too much with it I'm just going to sculpt out a few little little rolling hills here in our scene and then we're going to scatter our X frog plants around so we'll jump back to our our paint tool, or I'm sorry, we'll jump back to our sculpting tool. I'm gonna to select sculpt and yeah, that those are pretty good settings. So we'll just kind of add in a little a little hill over here, add a little, you know, a little rolling hill over here. I'm just trying to break it up. And you'll notice on areas that have steeper inclines, the grass disappears, rocks, uh, rock material starts to show up, and then procedural little rocks get dropped on. I've turned off a fair bit of the procedural stuff. I just wanted to only have those little procedural rocks drop in, but you can see after it thinks for a second, those little procedural rocks drop in and you can use your shift key to kind of push stuff down to like, if you wanted to have a, a little hole maybe over, over here or something, you could just hold down the shift key and, and drop that down. We'll probably have to rise that up a little bit because we're pushing through into that, into that other back, that other back plane actor. But I just want to, you know, kind of sculpt up ever so slightly some some little rolling hills inside of here and let's let's make my brush a little smaller and a little stronger and we'll just kind of crank something up right right over here a higher peak right there get some procedural rocks in that area too and you know kind of kind of do something over here now you also have a variety of other brushes you know there's smoothing brushes flattening brushes these erosion brushes these guys are really cool like if you come in here it's going to start to, to slope that guy down or or make some angled faces or something like that there's noise brushes so you can spend a lot of a lot of time kind of just coming in here and making really really beautiful landscapes using using this workflow it's it's, it's quite fun actually 
All right, so now that I've got that done, I'm just gonna hop over here onto our paint layer and I'm just gonna add in um, some mud or some dry grass or something else just to kind of break it up a little bit. So we'll just add a mud layer in, give you guys a sense of some of the other things the tool can can obviously do. Like just kind of come in here and just start painting a little, little bit of dirt underneath where the tractor is here. And then you can kind of obviously come over here and if you want, you could add in some more on this area. So I'm just kind of randomly breaking, breaking up the terrain, which you probably won't see after I start scattering a bunch of other uh, vegetation <laughs> around, but that's still good fun. That's ah, pretty awesome. So um, let's jump out of that guy and let's grab my tractor. And just give it a little you know, a little little kick like that, maybe. Nice. That's looking pretty pretty sweet. So, final step. Let's take all those amazing X Frog uh, pieces of vegetation and let's add them into the foliage tool and begin begin scattering these guys around. So this is uh, this is also very very easy and very straightforward to do. All right. So we'll finish the webinar off by painting the X Frog assets using the foliage tool, and this is really the most fun part of the presentation. So all we have to do is get the foliage tool turned on and go to the content browser and add to the foliage tool all the assets that we got from XFrog. So I'll just drag and drop these into the add foliage slot. They're gonna get placed inside of there. And now I can simply toggle on and off which assets I want to begin painting with. So for this example, I'm going to paint just with this first grass clump. If we highlight it, you can see a few of the attributes associated with it. So its density is set to 100 uh, per unit. It's going to randomly change its size between 0.5 and 1. And I've got my brush size at the top set to 400, so a relatively large brush. So I'm gonna be using that to essentially just kind of scribble in and almost flood fill this environment with a bunch of these little tiny grass clumps. And you can see in a matter of seconds, I just painted 800 grass clumps. So it's very, very fast to start to add in this, this kind of beautiful detail from your foliage assets. So now that we've done that, I want to change the, the asset that I'm painting with. And this is again, just a simple process of checking them on and off. So I'm gonna check off that grass clump and I'm gonna come down here and grab this larger grass clump. So this is going to give me the ability to paint out essentially rolling fields of green, which is really what I wanna have my tractor sitting on. You'll notice that this brush or this asset has a density set to 300. So as I start to paint this around and spray this out, you can see that it's obviously got a much, uh, much thicker coverage than the original little grass clump that we were using, which is exactly what I wanted. So I'm gonna kind of just scroll, scroll around and spin around and sort of paint, paint this really kind of nice looking grass sort of all around the environment here. And you can see how fast and easy it is for me to get these very realistic looking, uh, you know, foliage effects inside of Unreal. It literally just takes a matter of a few seconds. And then of course, as you start to, to rotate the camera around or, or drop the camera down into the, into the blades of grass, it just starts to look so beautiful, especially with that, that, you know, that kind of backlighting kind of coming across there and, and just giving us this really beautiful lighting model that we kind of set up earlier in the, in the presentation. So the next thing that I want to do is just add in a few weeds. So I'm going to grab this guy and I'll just, just paint a few weeds kind of across here, maybe a few weeds over there and a few up here. And we'll grab a couple more. I'll paint both of these at the same time. So I've checked on two weeds at the same time here. We'll kind of add in. I'm trying to get a, a variety of high things and low things so that it sort of is, as, you, as you drop the camera down inside of here, you know, you're going to get a different look of all these different types of, of foliage. And that just looks, that just looks so beautiful to me. Um, I just love, I love this tool. I could spend all day <laughs> painting landscapes. It's super, super peaceful. Um, all right, so we need some color. Let's go ahead and finish off by adding in a couple different types of weeds here. So we'll grab some dandelions. We'll start scattering some little yellow, you know, little, little yellow dandelions around there. That looks that looks pretty good. And then, um, you know, of course, it's always a good idea to add in some tiger lilies. These guys look beautiful when they're close to the camera. So we'll kind of scatter in just a little, little couple little stripes of tiger lilies inside of there. So now that we've got that done, um, you know, it's look, it's looking pretty awesome. Obviously I could continue to, uh, you know, maybe it, maybe I need more grass. It's, and again, super fast and easy to do. I'll just come back here, grab that brush. And, you know, in a matter of a few seconds, I've extended that, you know, that grass plane 
out out a bit further. And it's still obviously, you know, moving moving along at a very very nice frame right here. That looks great with that little little bleed kind of coming through and that backlighting. Like that's that's a pretty good looking shot right there. I don't I don't mind that one at all. So to finish this off, let's go ahead and exit out of the tool, and I'm going to go ahead and turn on a camera that's got some depth of field, and we'll just sort of you know pan around here, drop the camera down into the grass and. That is basically it, guys. So I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this webinar. We covered off a lot of stuff. We started in the beginning going over some lighting and some basic lighting models for exterior renderings. Then we jumped in and did a little bit of look development work on vegetation. And we talked about how to use the material editor pretty in depth. We talked about material instancing also. Of course, we had Kelsey and Stuart give us really, really nice demonstrations of how XFROG works and how Pivot Painter works. And then we finished off with doing some, some scattering of some plants on top of some landscape that we sculpted using Brushify. So that is, uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. I hopefully you guys enjoyed it. We truly appreciate your time. I know this one was a, was a pretty long webinar and I was definitely talking relatively quickly. So I appreciate you guys sticking with it. We do these about once a month, so uh, make sure you check, check out our next one. Cheers, everybody. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.